Andrew Keane is the author of Cult of the Amateur, How the Internet is Killing Culture, which was written in 2007. He has a new book called Digital Vertigo, and Andrew is here with me today. Andrew, thanks for being here. Dan, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Digital Vertigo, uh, I must say it's uh, very well researched. In fact, it's, I might call it erudite, a little above my head, but of course you went to Oxford and therefore you've got to put in all these uh, allusions to these famous people from history. But um, basically your thesis is that the social web and everything about sharing is killing society, not just killing culture. Well, perhaps I'd go a little further, Dan. The first book I wrote about the internet killing our culture, now I'm talking about social media killing our species. Killing the species? Yes. Is this, you kind of I, like, is this an Armageddon story? Well, it's a story about corpses. Uh, it's built off... Hitchcock's Vertigo, which is why it's called Digital Vertigo. And it's a book about illustrious corpses, the corpses of beautiful women, the corpses of technology companies, and the corpses of people like you and me who have lost what it is to be human by living so publicly. So explain a little bit more about the corpses and, and how as human beings we've lost what it means to live publicly. Well, in Hitchcock's Vertigo, which the book is built off, uh, it's a story that takes place in San Francisco all around us where a man falls in love with a woman who turns out to be dead and, and, the, and the movie is about him making love to that corpse. Uh, what I fear in our social media age is that we're living like corpses, spending our lives broadcasting ourselves to the world and we're losing our inner lives, we're losing the complexity, the privacy. Now how does a corpse broadcast to the world? That well, doesn't think, seem logical. It doesn't seem logical, but there's a lot of illogical things happening in today's world. I begin the book in London, where I'm at the corpse of a late 18th, early 19th century utilitarian philosopher called Jeremy Bentham, who has spent the last 170 years broadcasting himself to the world. So that idea of corpses broadcasting themselves goes from Jeremy Bentham in his famous auto icon at University College London to people like you and I, maybe, maybe not uh, you and I literally, but all of us who have our auto icons and becoming corpses on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Now you focus a lot of the book on, on Facebook, but let me kind of go to the end of the book. because I. The end's uh, good, isn't it? Well, the end is good, but I also think it brings up these points in, in kind of a, in a way people could probably understand a little bit better in terms of contemporary society and contemporary figures. But it's not figures. a difficult book, to be fair to it, is it? No, it's not difficult. It, it actually, Even you, if you can write very well. well. We'll put that, and here's some of your writing. You say that Reed Hoffman, who was the founder of LinkedIn and, 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 a, and an investor in many other social networks, including Facebook, Reed Hoffman says it's wrong to believe we are social animals. You also talk to Biz Stone from Twitter and, and you say that he is wrong to think that the future must be social. And you talk to Sean Parker from Facebook and the social network movie, of course, uh, that um, it's wrong that today's creepy is inevitably, inevitably today, tomorrow's necessity. And then you say instead, as John Stuart Mill reminds us, our uniqueness as a species lies in our ability to stand apart from the crowd to disentangle ourselves from a society and to be let alone and to be able to think and act for ourselves. Now, that sounds like people should be going out into the woods and chopping wood and living by themselves and being off the grid. Well, that's an American, that's a typical American response, Dan. I, I'm not necessarily sympathetic to, say, Thoreau, who would argue that we have to leave the grid and go and live in a shack. What John Stuart Mill was simply arguing that in, a, in an increasingly technocentric world, he was writing about the industrial age, in a world in which mass society was coming into being, we need to carve out a space where individuals can think for, for, for themselves. Because Mill argued, and I strongly agree with him, that innovation, creativity, is driven by the individual and not by the group. So if we want that innovation in our digital age, if we want people to be able to think for themselves. But why, do you, why do you think that, that, that everything is moving toward a dumb herd, so to speak? I fear the social web. I see what's coming into place. It's not just Facebook, although Facebook is the center of what now is being called the, 
the big data or the Web 3.0 economy, a link econ uh, a like economy as opposed to a link economy. We're seeing all around us in San Francisco thousands of startups all focusing on the social, enabling all of us on the network to tell the world what we're thinking, what we're well, drinking, what we're watching. But it's not just to tell the world what you're thinking, it's also to get things done. For example, to be part of a social network I just read about that helps you to find a parking space. So is it bad that people would know that I'm looking for a parking space you know, only if you're on that social network? Well, that's true. I'm, 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 I'm willing to tolerate social networks that that allow us to find parking spaces, but it goes way beyond parking spaces. You know that it goes to our musical tastes, what we're thinking, where we are, location networks, social location networks like Highlight and Glancy. And as more and more people in the world come on the network, we've got two billion now, we're gonna have about five, million, five billion by 2020 with 50 billion intelligent devices. We're all gonna be living more and more radically transparently. And I fear that that is taking away the uniqueness of the inner world of the human being. But how does it take away the uniqueness? Let me quote you again. You say that uh, Mark Zuckerberg's five-year plan is to eliminate loneliness. Don't you think that's a bit of an over-rotation? Well, it's not at all. I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg has said very clearly that his goal is to create a well-lit dorm room in which we can all live. Well, I think he's gone beyond the dorm room, obviously. Well, it's got, no, but he, and it's about, it's it's about a, sharing, so if it's about sharing, is sharing inherently something negative or that has evil consequences? I don't think it is, but I think the kind of radical nature that Zuckerberg wants, I mean, I, I'm not using the, the term eliminating loneliness um, thoughtlessly. I'm quoting Sean Parker who in his new video social startup, Airtime, has specifically said the goal of Airtime is to eliminate loneliness. I think well, don't you think that that's a bit of an exaggeration from someone who's a well-known character? Well, I think Sean Parker's a very smart guy, and I think if he says the goal of his new business... Well, he business, may be speaking more about himself than about the general populace well, I think the in one terms of eliminating loneliness. You know, I think the one person who isn't lonely and who doesn't have to worry about loneliness is Sean Parker. Yeah, but I think that's where maybe you're a little bit off. You're saying that, well, if all these people are social, socially connected, or if you have a billion dollars like Sean Parker, you're never going to be lonely. I think I was driven to, I was driven to write the book because I saw a paradox. I saw a world in which we're increasingly individualized, atomized, lonely, fragmented where society is breaking up, where the social is actually quite weak, in parallel with the cult of the social emerging on the internet. And that's well, what really Let me just ask you this then. If indeed that's the case, then how do you account for, let's say, the United States Congress being so inept in terms of accomplishing anything, collaborating, uh, doing things more in concert than in complete opposition? Is that, an, is that from an impact of the social web or from the emerging social revolution? I think we're living at a, and, and this is why my book was so historical, I, I think we're living at a, a really a truly transitional moment where we're shifting from an industrial um, mass society to a knowledge digital society. I think the problems with Congress, with our health system, with our media system, with the energy system are all part of that. I'm not sure how, how the problems with Congress are connected with my critique of social media. I don't see a connection. You don't see one? I don't think that social media it offers necessarily a solution to the political crisis in, in Congress. I write about politics. Clearly social media has an impact in changing ossified systems. It would be absurd But I think that is the point. We have well, seen changes we have in ossified systems such as Arab Spring, although it hasn't turned out as well as people would like. Um, we've seen how um, social webs, such as Twitter and Facebook, are transforming in some ways the political system in terms of the amount of information that's available to people, as well as the amount of noise. I would accept the fact that social media is having a, a transformative impact on politics or can do, certainly in the Arab Spring, in Russia, I reported on for CNN, um, the Occupy movement, the London riots. But what I fear is that the fragmentary nature of social media, the fact that it isn't really social, isn't resulting in coherent political movements. Look at the failure of the Occupy movement. Look at the London riots. Look at the, the failure, really, of the, the Arab Spring to become an Arab summer, and it now seems to me to be an Arab winter. 
look at the failure, even the resistance in, in Putin. Yeah, but you're looking at those failures as saying it's the failure of social media to have uh, an outcome that would be preferred by some people as opposed to that social media provided a catalyst and, and continues to. Well, I would accept that social media provides a catalyst, and I don't think there's anything, I don't, there's no doubt about that. What I would argue, though, is that and then many people like a, a Jeff Jarvis or a Clay Shirky or many other people believe that it's more than a catalyst, and I don't think it is. I don't think it's the holy grail. I don't think it's the solution to our political crisis, which I acknowledge exists, whether it's in America or in Europe or in any authoritarian state. So there's clearly a political crisis, a crisis of authority. But I don't think that social media can solve that unless it sorts out many of its structural issues. Now, you also seem to have an issue with uh, Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> related to a tiny group of individuals who are becoming remarkably rich based on using data, and that data and the product that they produce or use to produce their, their, their service is the information we give it. So how do you relate that to your historical perspective? Well, I think that Zuckerberg and Parker and Sandberg, and, and they're, they're brilliant people, all of them. I think they are the cream of our generation intellectually. I mean, all of them, all of them. I mean, they're, they're clearly brilliant people. But at the same time, they're a new elite. When Sheryl Sandberg, for example, says, well, with Facebook now we can all become authentic, or when Mark Zuckerberg says, um, uh, we're all going to live in this wonderfully well-lit dorm room. Or when Sean Parker says we're going to eliminate loneliness, what they're really saying is that I'm going to control all your data. No, I'm no, wait, wait. Are they really saying they're going to control your data? Well, I'm going to just... say that I'm going to aggregate all your data and monetize it in ways to make myself incredibly rich, which what, I don't necessarily but, but, have a problem but with. But what, what do those products, those so-called products, get in, in, in exchange for offering up all their personal data or some of it? Well, I think the problem is that most people aren't aware of the way these systems work. One of the purposes of this book is to argue that free is never really free. And in exchange for giving up our data, in exchange for using networks like Facebook and Google+, which are free, we are essentially handing over our personal data. We're becoming the product. Uh, Hitchcock made film noirs, and that's why I love Vertigo so much. We're living in a film noir now. We are the fall guy. We're the Jimmy Stewart in the 21st century movie. Uh, and people are really disturbed by that. Last week I wrote a piece for uh, CNN. Am I allowed to say CNN on CBS? Of course. Well, I wrote a piece about all this. It got almost, 20, ironically enough, 20,000 Facebook likes. Many But isn't, non that, isn't that a positive? Positive for who? For, for the whole system, in the well, sense that you, you're, you're writing how Facebook is evil. And well, I wouldn't, no, I'm not saying it's well, evil. I, was I think that's an exaggeration. It's not evil. And, and I don't think Zuckerberg or Sandberg are evil, but I think they are incredibly opportunistic, and I think that we need to push back at that kind of opportunity. All right, opportunity. so let's, let's talk about the solutions now. What would you propose as a way uh, so that the individual would have more say? For, yeah. I would say three or four parts, and, and this is key, and I have a, a, a couple of chapters on this in the book. The first is, as individuals, we've got to learn that we need to protect our inner lives, that we need to maintain a degree of mystery, particularly young people, but I don't think it's just a generational issue. Ultimately, it's up to us. And we can't you, rely on... And when you say uh, maintain a degree of mystery, what does that mean? It means that when... Th that we cannot reveal everything about ourselves on the network because we do away with who we are as individuals. If, 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 if I join every network and tell the world everything I like, but everything I... But how many I'm, people do that? Robert Scoble. Well, how many Robert Scobles are there in the world? Well, I don't know. There's probably quite a lot of people watching But this. it's still a very small percentage of yeah, the but Scoble, 7 billion know, people in the world. Yeah, but Scoble's the future. So, mm. No, you're saying that the future is people like Scoble. In other words, I want to broadcast everything. I want to be up on a pedestal. I want everyone to watch me. I want everyone to... Yeah, to, but Dan, to converse Dan, with Dan me. there are 900 and people, 900 million people, almost a billion people on Facebook. Now, not all of them, of course, are Scoble. But many of them are wannabe Scobles. Many of them are using this network thoughtlessly without really understanding what they're doing. Until they lose a job or something well, else happens yeah, because of what the, they've they're, done they're, online. They're the factual things. They could lose a job. They could be embarrassed. They could lose a spouse. Uh, they could lose a relationship with a child. But it goes beyond that. I think... This is new territory 
for the species. We've never lived at a time where we can tell the world everything about ourselves. And I think that this book and, 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 and this debate is about reminding but there people, were, but there that's have not always, advisable. There have always been exhibitionists, and I'm not saying Robert Scoble, who's a very well-known blogger and technology and person. And friend of yours. And, and friend, our, friend of ours. I'm not saying, and everyone doesn't want to be an exhibitionist in every era. With every technology, there were always people who wanted to step on the stage and, and be seen and viewed but and be we, the life of the party yeah. or be, be someone... Uh, you know, who would be looked up to as opposed to being part of the crowd. That, well, there's nothing different there. It's just the tools are better and there's going to be so you, more so, ways. So, Dan, you're saying that there's no change in the culture, that we're not living in an age of great exhibitionism, that when I write about digital narcissism in that book, that it's always been the same. Well, if you say putting up a picture of this or that is exhibitionism, then, then yes. But if it's simply communicating, well, because we have these tools, I can put up a picture, I can tell you what I had for breakfast, I can do this to my friends. You know, people can choose to view that, to engage with it or not. Well, I think that readers have to make their own decision. I think you're wrong. I think that we are living in an age where that kind of exhibitionism is becoming increasingly a salient feature in our culture. Uh, and if, if we aren't, then there's no point in the book. And then, and then I've wasted my time writing it because it's no different from any other time in history. Although, even if it's the same as in any t other time well, in history, now we different. have the technology. It's, it's obviously different. And I mean, when you have a company that doesn't really have any technology of its own that's worth, well, it was worth anyway, 100 billion, God knows what it'd be worth today, uh, when it has almost a billion members, when you have this continual explosion of social technology, social apps and platforms in Silicon Valley, I mean, that's real. This isn't just an exaggeration. So what, what is your, what's your prediction for the future let, let, evolution? Let me come back, but let me come back just to the, the solution. So the first, I think, is we all need to think for ourselves. It's not for me to tell people that they should or shouldn't be on the network on a Saturday or a Friday, or they should and shouldn't be on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. So everyone needs to make their own decisions. Secondly, I think we need to look at um, government. I think government does have a role. I'm not a libertarian, and I fear some of the sort of libertarianism in Silicon Valley. So I'm sympathetic to legislation in Europe demanding a right to be forgotten for information for users. I'm sympathetic to the do not track legislation going through the US Congress. Thirdly, I think there's a great role for innovation. The market is still key. So I think companies like EveryMe, Reputation.com, DuckDuckGo, you're seeing more and more companies, tech companies, really interesting companies, driven by the core premise of protecting privacy. And finally, I think technology has to be a solution. I like what uh, a Dutch university is trying to develop technology which will enable data to degenerate. And I think we've got to, f if, as we live more and more on the internet, as it becomes the platform for 21st century life, it needs to replicate the world we're used to. It needs to conform to what we want. And I think data needs to degenerate. We need to have situations where the internet learns how to forget. If we can teach the internet how to forget, then even I, will become a fan. Even I'll go back on Facebook. That's a promise, Mark Zuckerberg. I've been speaking with Andrew Keane, the author of Digital Vertigo. For CNET, I'm Dan Farber.